heard Stephen preach, I see him standing at the right hand of God the Father, Jesus. That's blowing his pharisaical mind off. He's probably unaware of this. And then, boom, he has the revelation. And then he has to go away for three years. So it's not about convincing someone of a theological position now. It's about a relationship with them within which you get to make uh, strategic comments that can do their thing. Uh, yeah, Baxter, I just loved everything you, you've been saying. Uh, the one question that I, has, have, that I have has to do with faith and the origin of faith. And, you know, my background is Calvinistic, too. But, there, but there's a, all those verses, you know, in the New Testament that scholars debate. They get translated, we're saved by faith in Jesus. And the Greek can be translated, we're saved by the faithfulness of of Jesus, and then Paul talks about, like, you know, the fact that when um, faith came, Jesus came, and he puts them all, like, in parallel. So it seems to me that if faith is a gift of the Spirit, that faith is like Jesus in us. And, and yet I'll hear you talk about violating will and stuff like that, and I'm wondering, well, what will gets violated? So I, I guess I'm asking... It, or, it seems to me part of the problem is that the modern American church has turned faith into a work as if it's our deal, you know? Right. And it seems like Scripture is saying, no, faith is is God's deal. And can you just talk into that, how you see that? Well, one thing you bring up is the question about the faith of Christ as opposed to our faith in Him. Uh, and I go with that in most of those passages in the New Testament. I've got a blog on this a couple of years ago called The Faith of Christ. Thing. There's some, a huge long go- ongoing debate about this. So um, when it talks about we're justified by faith in Christ, most of those are we're justified by Christ's faith, his faith and faithfulness to come and meet us and do what he's done. And then I think, and this is a good illustration if you'll turn to uh, Galatians 2.16. I'll give you a quick little run down of this because I think this is pretty fascinating how it shows you uh, what Paul is doing here. Um, Galatians 2.16 is what's called a uh, chiastic structure, which is sort of an X. It's like you got point one, point two, center point, point two, and then point one again. So listen to this. This is verse 16. Uh, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, that's point one, but through faith in Christ, that's point two, even we have believed in Jesus, that's the middle point, that we may be justified by faith in Christ rather than by the works of the law. You see how he does that? Well, the centerpiece there um, is our commitment to this. The other two should be translated, uh, well, you're not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus. And we have believed in the faith of Jesus rather than by the works of the law. That's his argument. So he, it's both in the sense of saying, we, we, it's like I said again and again and again, you can count on Jesus. You can count on he, he's the one that has hold of you. He's done that through his faith and his faithfulness. I think that's clearly the New Testament's main emphasis. Now he's saying to us, now what are you going to believe, Baxter? Are you going to count on me or are you going to count on your own works? Which way are you going to live here? So it's now me as a person. And I'm real. You're real. God's never going to violate our, the reality of our personhood. That's why it's relational. That's why the Holy Spirit's saying, what are you going to do? Are you going to walk with me or are you going to keep living in your own world? Even if you live in your own world, you still belong to the Father, Son, and Spirit by way of the faithfulness and faith of Jesus. But we can live in the darkness and the illusions of our own mind. That's the interplay to me in the New Testament. Again and again and again, saying, let this go. Today, walk with me. And let the works of the law or the works of religion or your self-effort, because that's just not going to work. It does, it does not produce the fruit. So it's both. You've got to hold on to the reality of our distinct personhood. Otherwise, we're just computers with Jesus software. And that's categorically not what the Father, Son, and Spirit have gone to all this trouble to have. They want us here and then brought fully up to speed. George MacDonald again. MacDonald says, If all we have is imputed righteousness or a robe to cover over our darkness, we're not ever going to be comfortable in this circle. 
because this circle is right. This circle is. Now, we've been made right in Jesus, and he's saying, now walk in that. And you walk in that little by little in an incremental process, and we're becoming who we are in him. Does that, does that help? This is a huge can question. I, yeah, can, well, yeah, because this, this gets to as the edge of a whole bunch of things. And if, if we don't walk in that, I mean, this is my understanding, so see if this makes sense. Well, I think that's what the Bible describes as Hades and Sheol and what Lewis describes in The Great Divorce. And, and uh, I mean, I've been fascinated by that. But, but I was also fascinated by this, that at the end of the Revelation, death and Hades get thrown in the lake of fire and death is no more. And I think that lake of fire is like the very substance of God, the lake of Theon. And so the, part, of the, part of the question then is, it seems like there is a point where God says, well, that, that reality, that false reality, that shadow reality is not endless. It must come to an end, and the end is my very substance, my being. Jesus, Jesus is the end. So, which then raises the, the question of, well, what, what does that mean? What does that mean for that, if that person is, in other words, that, that false reality isn't allowed to go on endlessly. And that raises all the questions about universalism, annihilationism, all that kind of stuff. And what exactly is getting annihilated and what's permanent. Um, well, the, the fact is, we don't know. That's the bottom line here, and I think there's a reason we don't know, because it keeps us relationally plugged in. If you got all the answers, you don't need relationships. So the reason the Holy Spirit's not clear all the time is he said, hey, how about listening to me? You know, and so we, wanna, we want to be able to theologically airtight this thing, and it's a relationship. And I don't know the answer to that question. I don't believe there is an end uh, I mean, it's not a logically or necessarily theologically an end to the darkness in that sense of us walking in our own worlds. To me, the New Testament says, Baxter, you can live in this mess if you want to. My Father and I and the Holy Spirit are never going to give up on trying to reach you. But you can live here if you want to. And forever and ever and ever if you want to. It's miserable. It hurts like hell. It's no fun. You're not made for this. You're never going to even write any music here. you know. But this is where we are in relationship. So that's where I think the New Testament ends it. And I have people all the time that are saying, yeah, but we got we got." And I, I just, I think it ends with we're included in this relationship. Now, what are we going to do today? Are we going to walk in this or are we just going to go, nope, um, I'm going to do it my own way. And it, it, um, it takes time and history for this to unfold. And so I don't have an answer to the, to the, final, um, the final word there. I mean, the final uh, thing about how this ends. How do, you, how do you deal with verses like where Paul in 1 Corinthians and Romans, you know, he says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ will, will all be made alive. And I don't know how to get around that verse in the sense that we'll all will be made alive. And have been made alive. That's, that's yeah, Peter's right, point. Yeah, right, right. I mean, I think Paul says that too in Ephesians. Yeah, you already are seated at the right hand of the Father. And um, that incredible verse about he's uniting all things in him this you know under this sacred head that's wounded and if he doesn't do it well i mean if he says i am going to do it and i've done it um well you may choose to live outside of that reality for a time but i mean even as i read scripture time itself has a beginning and an end so that's eternity right. isn't like just endless time it's a reality outside of this whole I, I think that you have a lot of legitimate questions that there are no real answers to and the only place to go there is in relationship to say Jesus I want to be okay with this I want to be okay with this and you can speak to my soul and help me be okay with this without having to try to answer it because you're not going to be it's like you cannot explain the, the origin of evil evil by definition is irrational but we keep trying to make sense out of it. And it's like, it just, there are places where we, you know, we, we can see how Olam in the Hebrew scripture, for example, which is translated eternal and forever, it has an end. It's like in the New Testament, it talks about in this age, Olam or Ionios, and in the one to come, which means this age, which is eternity, has an end. So there's all kinds of questions there. And I think the person that's done the very best of all that I've read is Bradley Jerzak in his book, uh, Her Gates Shall Never Be Shut. 
And he, le- he helps you to see all these things and leaves it here. And the only way we're going to be comfortable is, for, is to hear from Jesus on this. That's it. Um, because we want to be able to find a way to have an assurance or an answer logically. And that's different than it being true. You can have a logical argument that's still not true. So that makes... See, I mean, I'm, I'm not... People try to push me in, in direction. I'm not saying you understand. People push me because they want me to say it this way. And the New Testament leaves you looking straight at Jesus Christ and saying, what are you going to do today? What are we going to do today? Are we going to walk with him today and live in this relationship? Or are we just going to keep living in our, in our darkness and keep, you know? It's relational, not logical in, in the end. We can we can talk about that some more. There's, those things those those are huge questions. Wendy in the back, you got to wait for the microphone. <laughs> and that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> run, Forrest, run! I'd love to hear your perspective on Ananias and Sapphira. I got no clue. I have wrestled with that one for a good while. Um, uh, the the question about Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit uh, and got got the bug zapper. Um, but if that is a revelation of what the Holy Spirit is like, I don't know how I made it past 13. Because I guarantee you there's not anybody in this room that hadn't lied to the Holy Spirit. I do think perhaps there's something there like early on in setting a, a, it's like, wait, whoa, 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 what just happened here in the middle of Jerusalem? We don't normally have this sort of thing happening, and something has happened that's monumental, and it's to be taken very seriously. So it may be some of that. and uh, But I don't have, I, that's one of the questions that I have that I've got in my notebook that I have not gotten a, an answer to. But I, and this, and seriously, because what I, I've written them down, I, when I come across those, I just write them down and Ask the Holy Spirit. Say, Look, I don't get this because this does not, you know, I don't, I like Hillary's comment, not about the Holy Spirit, but about he is the best student who doesn't read his thoughts into the book, but steadily allows the book to expand his mind. So when you come to passages, Holy Spirit, I don't want to impose anything upon you. I don't understand this. So help me. And if I come across anything in my in my uh, reading that is of, of note there, I will let you know, and you can post it. And if you come across some, or any of you come across anything. I was just so tired because on Facebook, you know, my friends are very diverse, and they're all different kinds of people. And I was just You didn't know Facebook could communicate that way, did you? I never heard that accent, but... Um, <laughs> I'm told there's a there's a new Facebook coming, so. Well, especially in the context of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon all flesh just a few chapters before, um, so I, it's a it's a it's it's difficult to know. Um, I don't know how to answer that. Well, he was. I mean, he was. He, he betrayed Jesus. He, you know, he, he was always impetuous and always jumping in. And Jesus says, I'll, I'll meet you in your jerkness and watch me transform you into a, a real boy. So. I bet you in the early church there's a great answer to that question, Wednesday, Wendy. Wendy. I just have, I just don't know it right now, but some somewhere in the early church's writings they wrestle with that, and somebody came up with something. I bet you. Caleb's speaking on this tomorrow night. Actually, <laughs> here we go. I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Uh, you have given me a whole totally new perspective on the Trinity. Um, I 
guess I never thought about it that way and never really understood it that way until now. And I just want to thank you for opening up my mind to a whole new way of thinking. Amen. This lady said the other day, I don't know if I shared this with you earlier or not, but the, um, she said, the floor is the ceiling and the ceiling is the floor. <laughs> there are moments in our lives when the Holy Spirit turns the kaleidoscope and we get to see it in fresh and beautiful ways and we just walk right in and say, okay, I'll have more, please, Holy Spirit. So, it's just beautiful. I think we're what, what you're... What's going on inside of you is going on in people all over the world right now, and it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. Thank you. No, I'm sorry. Oh, he, he's being, he didn't see my hand go up. I was just teasing Mike. <laughs> um, and everything, you know, that you just said, obviously, how beautiful it is and how they've got... Here's the thing, you know, God having a relationship with every human being, right? So we're talking about human beings. So when so much of the church and we're talking about being born again and we're talking about perishing and I'm just wondering what your perspective is. I guess I always think about when, when Jesus says God so loved the world and we are, of course, everything is the love, right, of God and that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So maybe, maybe this is part of what you were saying. I'm not quite sure. but So I'm wondering, um, where the choice? You, you, you've talked about choice, I think. I was trying to hear, you know, that we have the choice, and you said we have the choice, and we can live in our own way and be in the darkness, you know. But do you feel that there is a place of, salvation beyond this world maybe and then then this perishing situation is that we have to choose choose jesus or somehow i know you say you know we don't have to choose him he's there he, you know he's always there for us he's been there but our choice somewhere how does that come in is my question even making sense but well you asked several questions one about the possibility of choice after uh this life you asked the question about john 3:16. 16 uh, it's interesting I mean, John 3, 16 is beautiful. That for God so loved the world, and that's us in our darkness, that he gave his only son, um, that whosoever, in fact, it says gave up his only son, gave him into the darkness, that whosoever believes in him. This is back to what I was saying. We can believe in, in ourselves, in our own way of thinking, or we can believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus, then we get to see his father with him. And as we see his father with him, that changes our experience. So what is it called in the New Testament when you know the Father? What does Jesus call that? And this is eternal life that they may know you. This is exactly what he says in John 3.16. For, for the Father so loved us in our darkness, he gave up his Son to be in the middle of it, in order that we who believe in Jesus, and not believing in ourselves in our own darkness, but believe in him, get to experience his Father with him. And he doesn't bring in the Holy Spirit there, but he, he could have easily said, and get to experience the the freedom of the Spirit. It's the same thing that John says in chapter 1 when he says, and it's a terrible translation, when it says, um, he came into his own and his own received him not, but those who did receive him and gave the right to become, you know, children of God. Um, the word become is not, it's not even really in there. Um, it's exousia in the Greek text, which means out of a person's being. And what John is saying is for, for those that receive Jesus and get to live out of this from here, they get to see who they are and they get to live in the freedom out of their being of the sonship that they have in Jesus. For those that don't see it, get to flounder in the darkness. And that's, that's the dialectic and the, and the interplay again and again in, the, in, in terms of the, 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 the summoning us to believe. I, I mean, I say it again and again and again. We can live in our own worlds. That means believing in ourselves. That means believing in the way we see things. It means insisting that Jesus Christ repent and believe in me and believe in my way of looking at things rather than saying, no, Jesus, I'm going I'm to trust you and walk with you. Now, if we're fighting him to get him to believe in our world, we're in the dark. And there's a, there's a price tag on terms of experientially. We're not going to be happy people. We're not going to get to live in the freedom of uh, the Father's embrace because we don't believe that. 
So that's one layer of what you were saying. And then there's a whole other question about is it, um, is it possible for us to have some sort of um, um, opportunity for belief after we die? Um, and I just say, well, of course. Uh, there's only one passage in the New Testament that seems to suggest otherwise about supporting for a man wants to die and after that comes judgment. And the word for judgment there is krisis in the Greek. <laughs> it means, to me, it means it's appointed for a person who wants to die and after that you meet Jesus. Yeah. And he knows that you know that he knows that you know. Right. So <laughs> you're not going to be able to quote Bible verses and, and do the shook and jive and you're going to be right there with him. And it is going to be a moment of revelation. So... I think I think these are wait 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 back up. I think that this is a highly abstract conversation, not this particular part, but this general discussion that we're having about this, because we have not yet been in a world where the gospel of Jesus Christ was proclaimed. Amen. Okay, so let's get to proclaiming this thing, and let's then see who doesn't respond and what happens. Because I think this is going to stir up the hornet's nest. I don't think anybody's going to be sitting on the sideline. We haven't been in a world where this Jesus has been proclaimed for a good long while. First time it happened and the second time it happened in our history, it changed the world. Right. So I, I, don't, this, I think when you proclaim Jesus, it does go to work. Right. I think it's already worked. So I want to, let's, let's uh, postpone discussions about that sort of thing for me and let's see what happens as we proclaim the truth of our inclusion in Jesus or his inclusive humanity and see what happens and see the liberation that comes. This lady's response, you know, thank you for what you're, you know, you're sharing, what we're seeing. I'm excited. I'll have more, please. So that's what I'm seeing is happening. So I think that's, that's, we need to have a couple of hundred years of that. And then I think we'll be more equipped to answer some of the questions that, you know, it's, um, I mean, here's an interesting little tidbit. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow morning perhaps, uh, but he, in Ephesians 1, he says that we were predestined to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ himself. Now, that word adoption means it's a multi-layered thing in the, in the scriptures. Uh, but he doesn't say we were predestined to justification. Right. And yet you go to any bookstore, any Christian bookstore in the Western world, and you can hardly ever find a book on adoption. You find tons of them on justification. And yet the apostle says that we were chosen, predestined before the foundation of the world for adoption. And in actual fact, there's only three books that I know of that have been written in the last four or five hundred years on this subject from an evangelical writer. And the one that was just recently written is like the whole argument of the book is that adoption is important to Paul. And I'm like... Uh, well, I mean, anybody that reads Ephesians 1 knows that. But here's the question. See, we haven't proclaimed this. We haven't, we haven't even been proclaiming that we were predestined to adoption through Jesus Christ. That hasn't been part of our vocabulary. It's not part of, it should be part of our discussion every Sunday. It should be on every radio station, every television station. Right. So let's do that for a couple hundred years and see where this thing shakes out on some of this. Because we haven't even done that. We've proclaimed separation, and now I'm going to tell you how you can get to Jesus and get his blessing. And then once you do that three or four or five years or maybe ten years and realize it doesn't really work, you're going to go over here and let him tell you what he thinks. And he's going to keep moving around. And, and this is the process that we're in historically. We've got a gospel to proclaim that is earth-shattering, that is, that, is, that is devastating to the darkness. And let's proclaim it and, and see how this shakes down. Let's see how many people wake up and are in the conversation.
That's fantastic. It's the tuning fork. It's the tuning fork. Now, one thing, you used the word tradition, and they were traditional, and I, I like that word tradition. And one of the things that fascinates me uh, in my larger conversation with people is I'm the traditionalist. I'm the ancient dude. <laughs> this is not modern. This is the early church. <laughs> so I'm the fundamentalist here. <laughs> I think that's funny. <laughs> oh man, I do. I think that's God's sense of humor there. It is the patience of God that leads us to light and to change the way we're thinking about things. <laughs> 